All right. Well, welcome everyone to CPHA's Infectious Disease and Climate Change webinar series. This is the first webinar in our series, which will be exploring current and emerging infectious disease and climate change topics to support and inform the work of professionals and providers and share knowledge, research, and best practices. To learn more, um, please visit our website at cpha.ca. Before we begin, we want to acknowledge that the Canadian Public Health Association's office is situated on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabeg people. They have been the guardians of this land for millennia, and we are grateful for the example their stewardship provides. CPHA is committed to working with all First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people and their governments in realizing meaningful truth and reconciliation. We'd also like to express our deepest gratitude to all of the frontline essential workers dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. We thank you for all your hard work keeping us safe during this time. Today's webinar, Instance, Location, Wildlife Reservoir Species, and Biogeographical Modeling of Leptospirosis in the Canadian Maritimes is brought to you by the Canadian Public Health Association through the Infectious Disease and Climate Change Project. I'm Gillian Pritchard, Project Officer with CPHA, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. But just a few housekeeping things before we begin. It should be noted that all Zoom attendees are muted, and if you have any questions for the presenter, please put them in the Q&A box at any point during this webinar. All of the questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. Only you, myself, and our presenters can see the My Questions section, and you will also have the option to submit these anonymously if you wish. When asking a question to the presenter, the question will first be read out by myself and then answered live by the presenter. If you have any questions regarding technical difficulties, please ask them in the Q&A box as well, and we will reply to you as soon as we can. And if multiple people are experiencing the same problem, we'll address it live. We strongly encourage all of our attendees to participate, and we look forward to hearing your thoughts and questions. Just a few quick notes that this webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the CPHA's YouTube channel a few days after this presentation and our presentation slides will also be shared. We'd love to get your feedback, so please fill out our five minute survey at the end of the webinar upon closing the webinar window. And finally, a CPHA are holding an infectious disease and climate change forum on October 5th of this year, and our call for submissions is now open. So please visit our website at cpha.ca for more details. And now I'd like to introduce our speakers for today's webinar. Our speakers are Dr. Vet Lloyd and Samantha Bishop from Mount Allison University. Dr. Lloyd is a professor of biology at Mount Allison University with expertise in molecular genetics and epigenetics. Recent work has focused on zoonotic diseases, particularly vector-borne diseases. She has a special interest in encouraging community and citizen science and tick surveillance activities as a way to help tick-proof communities and incorporating the patient and other communities as full partners in research. Samantha is completing her Master's of Science at Mount Allison University in New Brunswick, working on zoonotic diseases with an emphasis on leptospirosis. She completed a Bachelor of Science at the University of New Brunswick, spending a year of that abroad at the University of Birmingham in the Biosciences program. Her interests include the study of zoonotic diseases, overscheduling herself, and knitting. She is now the director of the Mount Allison University Tick Lab. With that, I'd like to turn it over to our speakers can now start sharing your screen. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, and we will do the inevitable uh, messing around to start sh sharing screen. Uh, all right. So does that appear to be sharing? Yes. All right. So thank you very much for the opportunity to tell us, uh, to tell people about our work. Um, we very much love the chance to talk to people about various things that are going on. And this talk is uh, on leptospirosis, as you'd gather from the title. Uh, we're focused on New Brunswick because that's where we live. Nevertheless, leptospirosis is an emerging disease globally as well as locally. Um, so I think it's the findings here are applicable across Canada as well as in other temperate regions of the globe. I'll be doing the first part of the talk and Samantha Bishop will be doing the second part. 
So um, we're going to start with some background, a uh, quick primer on leptospirosis and cover the specific aims of the talk. Samantha will then take over when we get to the methods, seeing as how she's been the person to actually do the work. Uh, she'll tell you about the results and then we'll end up with me talking about the significance in the end. And I guess technically I'm allowed to do this. <laughs> okay, so to get started, what is leptospirosis? It's a disease caused by infection with leptospires. Leptospires are a spirochete bacteria. Spirochetes are one of the sort of oddball bacteria. They're neither gram positive nor gram negative. As you might gather from their name, they're spiral shaped. Uh, so long, skinny, squiggly, it's basically uh, a spiral. Yeah, who'd, who'd have guessed? The spirochete clade is shown on the right of this slide. And there are any number of spirochetes. Certainly the more famous spirochetes are Borrelia, which cause uh, things like Lyme disease, Lyme disease-like diseases, the relapsing fevers. The leptospira are a basal group, which means uh, a number of things, but the most significant part is that they hang on to the, what we assume is the ancestral mode of transmission, which is waterborne, so in, generally in through ingestion, collect in the kidneys, out through urine. Uh, and the spinny, all right. Mm -hmm. We're working on the world's oldest computer. Uh, so leptospires, as I mentioned, they're spirochetes. You can see some pictures of them here. They're 60 odd species. They're considered to be mostly saprophytic. There have been multiple cases when they be can become pathogenic. This has been occurred independently several times in evolution. The pathogenic species, like many pathogens, are divided into serovars, um, subspecies if you're, if you're into species, um, depends on how you want to use the terminology. As spirochetes go, leptospires are, are on the cute end, insofar as a spirochete can be cute. They tend to be longer and skinny, longer and more clearly spiral shaped than some of the other spirochetes. They have the cute little hook thing happening at the end. Um, and that's probably about all I want to say about, about bacterial morphology. Okay. Now, why do we care about leptospires? We care about leptospires because they're incredibly abundant worldwide. Tradition, the traditional view is that there are only a few problem wild species that act as reservoir, uh, primarily the rodents. When it comes to zoonotic diseases, if we're not blaming bats, we'll blame the rodents. Uh, however, a recent study has looked at any number of leptospire isolations from other animals, and there are a huge number of different animal species that can harbor leptospires. And there's certainly a increasing recognition that there is no one specific reservoir host. So in addition to the traditional rodents, we're also seeing amphibians and reptiles. Perhaps that's not surprising. They hang out in water. Um, I'm gonna show you some pictures of moose, and, well, icons of moose and bear later on. Uh, again, animals that hang out in water, but it's also, uh, leptospires have also been detected in whales and dolphins. So there are not a lot of animals that cannot get a leptospira infection. This becomes a problem because of humans, although we're considered accidental hosts, we interact with animals, whether it's your friendly pat, cat, dog, pet. Uh, we also interact with wild animals, increasingly with changes of human habitation, suburban uh, building going out into formerly rural agricultural land or wild lands where there are increasing opportunities for zoonotic transmission. 
Uh, we also have recreational activities that can take place outside in wilderness areas. So the map on the right is emphasizing all the different places that there have been leptospira outbreaks and as you can see basically pretty much everywhere. The extreme tropical areas, Africa is not, doesn't have any documented cases, but there's that's probably a matter of surveillance as opposed to Africa being somehow geographically immune. All right, so I mentioned the fact that it's present in many animal species. How does it get into humans? So it's present everywhere and the, probably the best known outbreaks are those associated with humans interacting with wildlife um, and humans interacting with contaminated water supplies. So this is a map from the CDC. It's emphasizing primarily recreational exposures, uh, so whitewater rafting, canoeing, so forth, where people may accidentally ingest contaminated waters. The triathlon was again swimmers uh, slurping in some water as they go along. Um, that certainly is a problem, it happens, but bear in mind that a lot of the other exposures are through water supplies particularly in Canada and very much in New Brunswick, which I'll talk about in a moment. A lot of our water reservoirs are basically derived from natural watersheds. That's the best place to get water. And although treatment facilities can get, can and do work well uh, to get rid of leptospires, if there are different, if, if there are problems with the water treatment or in some communities there isn't effective water treatment, there's a possibility for water supplies to become contaminated. One particular challenge, which I'm going to touch on shortly, is flooding events. That relates to both climate change and why we decided to focus our study on New Brunswick. Before I get there, I want to emphasize the primary transmission route and the consequences of a leptospira infection for both humans and for our companion animals, our pets. Okay, so for transmission, when I was showing the phylogeny of this spirochetes, I alluded to the fact that they have a they're relatively close to the base of the spirochetes, which means waterborne transmission. The general mode of transmission is through ingestion. So wild animals will drink contaminated water. The spirochetes will burrow through their body. They can burrow through the vasculature. They end up in highly vascularized tissues. Um, in addition to all the other highly vascularized tissues, they're particularly fond of the kidneys and the kidney epithelia. That means when your wildlife, uh, this cute little mouse here, urinates, see the nice yellow dot, very discreet, uh, that will have the leptospires in it, which can then end up in waterways, particularly associated with a flooding event. And in the natural environment, leptospires are incredibly hardy. You can keep them alive in distilled water for about 100 days, um, and if you use a more natural, more viscous solution, uh, such as fresh water with a bit of murk or stuff or mud in it, they're good for about a year. So you can certainly find them in lakes um, at low density. They're not an abundant bacterial species. It's not like these blue-green algae where you get blooms. They're at low density, but you can find them in lakes, rivers, and they're also hang out in puddles, stagnant water, such as puddles, and when you have receding water from spring floods. The puddles, the lakes, are a problem in terms of transmission because other animals will use them as a water source. So your pet dog, um, many dogs consider the water from a puddle to be absolutely delectable and will cheerfully slurp down puddle water in preference to nice fresh tap water. If infected, that means your dog can get infected. That's not only bad for your dog, then we set up, uh, the other problem is that it sets up a pathway for transmission directly to the humans that live with the dog. So that 
means of contamination through canine urine is very much a risk for those in the veterinary profession. So you can get transmitted to humans. Human transmissions are associated then with recreational exposure. Um, children who tend to splash around in puddles a bit more than adults and those who are associating with dogs professionally or as part of their lifestyle choices. Focus on what it does to you. All oh, this, this looks rather grim, fever chills, that's the usual response to infection. That tends to be an early stage response. Uh, the innate immune system is being activated. Um, it can, there's generally two phases. There's the initial response and then after about a week, the acquired immune system kicks in. During all this time, the leptospires, which are like many spirochetes, quite good at uh, doing an end run around our immune system, are busy traveling throughout the body. They don't hang out in the blood very much. They like tissues. Once they invade highly vascularized tissues, they are fond of the lungs, which can cause problems when you'd like to breathe, for example, um, and they end up in the kidneys. And that in particular is the problem. They hone in on the kidneys because they want to be transmitted. However, too much inflammation in the kidneys is not good. Um, so while many individuals are able to fight off infection, this is true of both humans and dogs, there are many people who deal with this with either mild symptoms or completely asymptomatic. In immunocompromised individuals, old animals, young animals, um, speaking primarily of dogs here, but the same would be true of human, you're more likely to have symptomatic manifestation of the disease and uh, negative outcomes. All right, and just to emphasize modes uh, of transmission. So we have a couple of cases that are highlighted by the CDC, uh, which is in the context of recreational activities in fresh water. Uh, kayaking, whitewater rafting, which is a risk all of its own. Um, we're also seeing in North America, as well as in Europe, an increase of leptospirosis infection in urban children. To some extent, that's associated with parks, uh, with a wading pool that perhaps is not being cleaned out enough. Parks are also a magnet for small rodents. Uh, but in addition to recreational exposure, we have occupational exposure, uh, veterinarians I've mentioned, people who are working outdoors in terms of farmers, military personnel, mine workers, sewer workers, obviously slaughterhouse workers. So there is both recreational and occupational exposure for the human population. Okay, so now we're going to focus on the actual study, which is in New Brunswick. So why did we choose to study New Brunswick? Obvious answer is we happen to live in New Brunswick, so it's handy, keeps the transportation costs down, which turned out to be extremely handy because COVID came along. Um, but a more scientific reason for studying New Brunswick is that New Brunswick is both very green and very soggy. Uh, so in our sort of seven million or so hectares of land, six of that is consists of trees. So essentially New Brunswick is a fine place to store trees with a few humans scattered around the province. Um, the province population is roughly 50% rural, which is higher than most other parts of Canada. We have a large proportion of people who are living in small towns and are using the wild, wild areas for subsistence income, uh, local woodlot harvesters, farmers, fishers, that sort of thing. The other issue is we have a lot of farming, agricultural land that's important. Agriculture, particularly forestry, is an incredibly important part of New Brunswick's economy. And we are a wet province. We're fairly low, we're fairly wet. We have a lot of watersheds and those watersheds are used obviously for drinking water. So if you look at the municipalities in New Brunswick, those are fed from 30 different watersheds. 
And the final reason is, ties into climate change, is that climate change does many things. Climate change is changing the climate, that changes the wildlife, but it also changes the incidence of major weather events. And the pictures on the right, on the top, you see the St. John River, which is one of our largest rivers in the province. It basically goes directly across the province. This is the top image is normal spring flooding. And the bottom picture is the same river uh, shown during uh, an atypical flood event, except those rare atypical flood events are becoming increasingly common. And as you can see, there is a lot more water there. That water results in essentially flooding, which brings, not only does it push the wildlife into non-wet areas, it stresses the wildlife, increases the risk of leptospirosis in stressed animals, and it increases the opportunity for the leptospires that are in contaminated soil, contaminated puddles to get into the larger waterways and circulate that way. So climate change is important for increased flooding events, which increase transmission. It's also really important for changing the distribution of wildlife. And this map here is showing the province of New Brunswick. What we're mapping here is areas that are suitable for maintaining tick populations, which is somewhat beside the point in this talk. The top row is over time with a moderate climate change scenario and the bottom row is the climate change scenario we're actually seeing. Uh, red is where it's suitable for ticks. In this case, it's not so important that it's suitable for tick populations, but it's also suitable for the reservoir hosts for ticks, which are rodents for a large extent. And these are the same animals that are very effective at being a reservoir for leptospires. So as clim the climate mod changes, we're going to have a climate that is more rodent friendly, among other things, which means that there is likely to be increasing risk over time. Now, with that as an introduction, I'm going to highlight the really important reasons why we were drawn to this, which is we'd actually started the study because we thought leptospirosis was going to be an issue. There had been one outbreak in Nova Scotia, which received a lot of media attention. Um, Whenever you have dogs dying, you get media attention. And then when you get sick veterinarians, it gets serious. So that was already a heads up that this was an issue. And then shortly after we started the study, wouldn't you know it, our study organism decided to come play a visit. Uh, so right on one of the, major, the tourist attraction water feature on campus, we had a uh, leptospire outbreak. Um, unfortunately, several dogs that use that area for recreation were, inf uh, were infected, they died. Um, we had some local veterinarians who got very scared and one or two got ill. So it certainly was a good <laughs> a reminder we perhaps didn't need is that this is important. Uh, the municipalities were wonderful in immediately putting up signage, and I think that helped a lot. But it does emphasize that leptospirosis outbreaks are random. You can't predict when a specific waterway is going to become, have a high enough load that it can lead to infection, when those infections will leap into the companion animal and the human populations. And this paper cited below simply emphasizes that it's a global public health problem. So with that, I'm going to talk about the specific aims of the study and then hand over to Samantha, who actually did the work, uh, to tell you how it was done. So we had three specific aims. One is we wanted to find out what the baseline was for leptospirosis in the Maritimes, both in the wildlife population and companion animals. We didn't know, we don't know what the, what the baseline is right now. And if we're expecting a change in the future, it's useful to know what's happening right now. 
The second thing we wanted to do was find out if there are wildlife species that we can use as sentinel. That's largely because testing water is really painful, slow and difficult. And if we had a wild species that we could use as a sentinel, that would allow improved uh, surveillance. Finally, we looked at different surveillance methodologies. So with that, uh, Samantha is pictured here, sampling water and looking at stuff. So I'm going to hand over to her to tell you about what we actually found. Thank you, thank you. Okay, quick swap and a bit. Okay, so for the methods overview, I just wanted to touch on the three main projects that we had looking at leptospirosis. So we started with canine serology, um, then we decided to go into wildlife to determine how, um, how prevalent it is in our wildlife species. And then we did also try to test the water samples, which proved to be incredibly difficult with uh, not a whole lot of results that we were looking for. So the first one, the canine serology. Um, in order to set up this project, the first step was to recruit partners through veterinary clinics. So once we had established a base of 14 uh, vet clinics across the province, we could then obtain the, the informed consent of the pet owner. So at the time of the sample collection, the dog owners completed a consent form and provided information on the risk factors of their pet. So dogs who were vaccinated for Borrelia within the past year, those who did not spend time outdoors or who were too old, small, ill, or aggressive for safe blood collection were excluded from the study. Then 50 blood samples were collected over the course of three to 10 days in the fall of 2013, and again in the spring of 2014. The serum was then stored at minus 20 degrees Celsius at the veterinary hospital where it was collected before it was sent to the Mount Allison uh, lab for testing for a previous study. It was then biobanked until later use which approximately one year after the initial study, we went back into the freezer, obtained these samples and sent them out to IDEX for testing in order to determine the presence of leptospirosis. The results were returned to the participating clinics in order for the owners to be notified and the data was analyzed. Um, the next project was focusing on our wildlife samples. So for the wildlife samples, testing was performed on a wide range of species from various sources. Uh, the samples included an entire carcass of small mammals and birds. Um, they were donated to us by members of the community and a section of tongues, specifically from black bears, white-tailed deer, and moose. The samples from local hunters came from across the province. Um, they were submitted by Dr. Brian Hayden to us. Uh, he works at the University of New Brunswick. So the small wildlife samples were obtained, thank you, <laughs> uh, were obtained from the Lloyd Lab Biobank with a lot of the samples previously cataloged, dissected, and DNA extracted by a master student before me, Chris Sink. Uh, and all that was done before I arrived. So I just mostly got to work with the DNA, which made it a little bit easier. Uh, this collection of samples was created entirely from uh, donations thanks to citizen scientists. And I really, really want to point out that citizen science is crucial to keeping um, our numbers as up to date as possible and we would not be able to do what we do without the help of our community. So that was really appreciated. Um, then the extracted DNA, so mainly from liver and kidneys or tongues, but not limited to bladder, muscle, and skin was amplified with nested PCR primers using the RRS gene coding for the 16S rRNA uh, determining the presence of leptospirus species. And finally, our water samples. So we ended up using three different methods as each were published um, throughout the years with favorable results. So to determine the success rate of each, we attempted all three. So we started with method one. Samples were collected by undergraduate students from across the province in sterile 50 milliliter tubes when they traveled home um, over the March break in um, 2019. These samples were then centrifuged 
and we attempted to pellet the bacteria in the water and then we followed by an extraction of any DNA using a chiogen kit and following the steps specifically for gram negative, negative bacteria. Uh, method two, so we moved away from the centrifugation uh, to pellet the bacteria as it was difficult to centrifuge large amounts of water and to hope for an invisible pellet. So the sampling method uh, was also changed for this step, leaving just one person responsible for sampling in a single day. Water was then kept on ice until storage was possible at the university and samples were stored at minus 20 until ready to be processed. The timing and location for the sampling method was also adjusted to focus on the spring fresh event around the St. John River. So in May of 2020, the samples were collected from puddles as a result from the receding floodwaters of the St. John River, starting in Woodstock and working their way down to Jemseg. The samples were then thawed and filtered twice through two filtration sizes. The filters were then removed from their plastic encasings and the DNA was extracted using the same chiogen kit and protocol as mentioned in method one. Then for method three, uh, this included the same sampling method as method two with a few alterations. So the samples were collected in the fall of 2020, also around the St. John River, and I returned to the same sites um, as the spring session. However, fewer samples were collected as there were no flooding events during this time, meaning a lot of my sites were now dry land. The Samples were again kept on ice until handling at the university was possible. Instead of storing the samples at minus 20, these were placed at four degrees and filtered within 24 hours to ensure that the bacteria would not die before the next step. Uh, the samples were again twice filtered, uh, removed from the plastic encasings, and placed in BSK media for approximately two weeks, uh, with a subset of samples being monitored every few days to ensure growth was happening, and then DNA extraction was carried out. The extracted DNA was amplified with PCR primers, again targeting the RRS gene coding for 16S rRNA to determine the presence of leptospire species. So the results, back to the canine uh, blood samples. So um, as you remember, these samples were collected specifically from 14 different veterinary clinics, so it is split up that way. Um, it is fairly spread out throughout the province. And the main thing to take away from this is that there are positive cases throughout. It's from everywhere, from everywhere we collected pretty much. Um, there's no obvious correlation with watersheds. So the main one being the St. John River that runs up through Fredericton and back down through St. John or through the Miramichi River, um, which continues into the province over here. So particularly in the north, we're seeing high reactivity, especially in dogs, but it's not restricted to there. And an important takeaway is that serology doesn't necessarily distinguish between the serovars. So uh, being able to do the study, we were able to pick up both pathogenic and non-pathogenic leptospires. Um, nevertheless, it is everywhere, it's still a concern. Um, and the reason why we moved into the wildlife samples is because serology only tells you exposure. It does not give you direct detection, and it doesn't tell you if the animal is infected right then and there. Um, also, as I mentioned, we don't know if it's pathogenic or non-pathogenic. So we moved into the wildlife samples. So the results for this, um, basically what I wanted to point out here was the number of samples from the mammals was um, pretty spread out. So we didn't have equal number throughout each species and that's just part of getting samples from the general public. We don't get to control what gets submitted to us. Um, however, the samples from Dr. Brian Hayden at the University of New Brunswick, the moose, deer and bear, oops, um, those were fairly um, proportional to each other, so those are a little bit easier to draw conclusions from. So the small mammals and birds, as you can see, are slightly more variable. Um, the majority of the small uh, mammals tested were from meadow voles, um, which you can see here, um, followed by deer mice, maritime shrew, and jumping mice. These four species make up 38% of all the animals tested. 
the deer, moose, and bear together make up 52% of all the animals tested. And so out of everything, 11.9% uh, tested PCR positive for leptospira species. And they were later sent away to be confirmed by uh, sequence confirmation. And uh, those are highlighted in the blue at the bottom. So not quite as many, but we still have some. And then to really focus on what came back as positive, I just wanted to show you before that there was a difference um, in the animals that we got, but to focus on the positive results that we got, it was very varied um, through different species. Um, a lot of the times our PCR positives um, didn't come back as positive by sequence confirmation. Um, that could be because of false positives um, or other things like that. Um, so if you look at the um, the bear, the deer, and the moose, surprisingly, those did come back as positive for leptospirosis, and then the small mammals is quite varied. And then just an overview specifically of the large mammals, because they were spread out across all of the wildlife management zones that you can see on the map on the left, um, I wanted to highlight these specific, these three specific species, because it gave us a good indication of what it's like across the province. All of the small wildlife was really focused um, around the university because it was easier for people to submit these samples to us. So they were mostly in wildlife zone number 25. Um, but to see the general spread across the province, I did use these species. And this data specifically is sequence confirmed. So we know for a fact that it is leptospira species that was found. And trying to determine if there was an overlap with the watersheds, there is the map of the watersheds of New Brunswick on the right. And there is a bit of overlap suggesting maybe something along the upper St. John River. Uh, and it's a little bit harder to see, but in the middle of the province, there is the Miramichi River. There may be some overlap between those two, but because it isn't as far spread as I expected, especially along the St. John River, it's hard to say for a fact that it's um, surrounding those. So the summary for the wildlife. Overall, we do see the presence of leptospirus spirochetes in our wildlife species, but it has a slightly higher prevalence in our small mammal and bird species. Out of the 283 bear, deer, and moose samples that were tested, 3.5% tested uh, PCR positive, with the final 1.8% being sequence confirmed. Uh, the small wildlife category include, include samples from small mammals to birds, and of the 561 samples I tested from this category, 11.8% tested PCR positive, with the final 3.2% being sequence confirmed. Um, well, there was a second image here, but it's gone now. But basically, this is the results from our water samples. So method two didn't return anything. Everything at the bottom here is likely primer dimers or just uh, false positives. What we did expect to see was um, slightly higher around the second band here um, if it was positive for leptospire species. Uh, our method three did return bands in the correct area, so we were excited to see that we um, potentially extracted DNA from water samples. However, when they were sent away for sequencing, um, they didn't confirm the presence. Um, it in fact returned a bunch of random bacteria that was commonly found in soil, but not leptospirosis. So out of all three methods, none of them returned um, positive results. And for the conclusions, I will hand it back to Dr. Wood. Okay. All right, quick switch, <laughs> musical presenters. Okay, so to conclude, our first goal was to determine the frequency of leptospirosis in the maritime wildlife populations. Uh, to do that, we can rely on the canine serology results, and they were surprisingly high. So 30 to 50% of the dogs throughout the province were seroreactive for leptospira. That doesn't tell us whether it's pathogenic or non-pathogenic serovar. 
So if we look at the wildlife results, that basically gives us somewhere between three and 9% of our wildlife species carrying leptospirosis. There are two takeaways from this. The first is that it's throughout the province. There is no particular one area that's a hotspot. In a way, that's bad news because if there was a single hotspot, you could focus on the hotspot and say, look, everyone else is okay. But it does seem to be a problem throughout the province. The second thing we wanted to do, the point of focusing on such a broad array of wild species is to figure out if there's one that we could monitor to as a sentinel for leptospirosis outbreaks. Turned out that that's not going to work because we're finding leptospirosis at more or less the same incidence in most animals. Uh, so squirrel, mouse, bear, moose, whatever. Um, I guess the good part of it is that it's probably easier to collect mice than moose. So we don't have to go out and start trying to grab moose for surveillance. And I'm even happier we don't have to do surveillance on bears. Uh, but it does mean, again, speak to the widespread within the province prevalence of the leptospires. Finally, when it, we were looking at surveillance methodology, whether ser uh, ser surveillance, so using serology is better, using wildlife is better, using water sampling. Uh, certainly water sampling did not work out for us and Samantha tried every, many, many different ways, many cr creatively. And this actually corresponds with uh, my attempt to find commercial, pe uh, commercial services doing this because my first thought was, hey, it'd be so much easier if we could pay people to do it for us. Um, and there we were unable to find commercial providers. So yeah, water sampling, not easy, probably related to the fact that you can get disease with a very low bacterial load of leptospires in the water. Between canine serology, um, that is certainly convenient because veterinarians are taking dog blood all the time for various purposes. Um, IDEX, which is the primary North American uh, veterinary diagnostics uh, organization company, uh, does provide real-time updates, although not in this part of the world, for leptospirosis. And working with veterinarians is very good because giving the information back to the veterinarians is a fantastic way of making sure that veterinarians have the data they need to persuade their clients that a leptospira vaccination is a fantastic idea for pets. So that's one real perk of working with veterinarians. Downside is that serology is quite nonspecific. So the DNA work with the wild animals uh, gives us a much better idea of the full scope of potential reservoir species, which is almost everything that drinks. Um, but it's a little bit more difficult. And by the time you're sampling someone's liver or kidney, yes, it's uh, a terminal event for that. So you are killing animals, which can be problematic when you're doing it with the goal of improving wild, wildlife health. With that, uh, we are pretty much on time for the 45 minutes for the talk. A huge number of people helped uh, with this, this work uh, involved Chris Sink, who was helping out, uh, and Berthold uh, also helped out. I really want to fo focus on the importance of community in pretty much all the science we do. We had citizen scientists who are donating an indecent number of birds and mice, often fairly decayed, but Thank you anyway. Um, local hunters, uh, the veterinarians throughout the province, um, and other researchers, we're doing this with a lot of help. And wouldn't do not to thank the funders. So thank you very much the Public Health Agency of Canada, the Infectious Disease Fund. Um, other bits of the biobanks that we drew on for this have been funded by NSERC and Canline. So with that, I am very happy to take questions and over to you. 
Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Lloyd and Samantha. That was a fantastic presentation. So interesting to see what's going on in New Brunswick with leptospirosis. So I'm just going to share my screen now. Okay, so I'll stop sharing. Oh, you've done it for me. Perfect. <laughs> All right, one second. There we are. All right. Um, so just a reminder to all of our participants that this webinar is being recorded and all of the, um, the, the recording will be shared on our YouTube channel and the presentation slides will be shared as well. Um, if you have any questions, now is the time to ask them. So we have a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So if you have any questions, please type them in there and I will read them and um, Dr. Lloyd and Samantha can answer them. All right, so we've got our first question here. Um, it says, very interesting results, thank you. I know lepto is reportable in people in New Brunswick, but I believe the numbers are low. Why do you think this might be? Do you think it may be underdiagnosed or underreported in people? Um, so I'm going to answer that based on conversations with veterinarians who are um, the some of the people who are most at risk of leptospirosis. And I think it's both. Uh, you have a number of people who are asymptomatic or only mildly symptomatic, so they may not go for, they may not seek out the healthcare that would lead to testing for lepto that would result in a report. So I, th I think it's all of those things under uh, people not seeking out healthcare, people, perhaps a lack of awareness that if you've got a veterinarian coming in, uh, that perhaps a lepto test would be appropriate because veterinarians are exposed to sick animals. So certainly they're a wonderful sentinel for any kind of zoonotic disease, although that's perhaps not, some, not how they would choose to look at it. That's great, thank you. Um, I think some people are typing questions, but while we wait um, for some other questions to come in, I have um, a question for you. I know um, at, during the presentation, you showed the map showing that um, reservoir species for ticks and also polyleptosporosis leptospirosis was more clustered towards the south of New Brunswick and less in the north, just based on your climate, but that as climate change um, goes forward, it will show kind of we're seeing those reservoirs all across the province. And in your results, it showed that we are seeing those leptospirosis all across the province. So do you think that is a result of climate change that we're seeing those climate change effects already? Um, yeah, so there, uh, there, the map showing the clustering at the south was mm -hmm. Uh, suitability for ticks and ticks being cold-blooded animals are very sensitive to temperature um, and they need it to be warm enough long enough for them to complete a, a decent chunk of their life cycle they also need to find blood so they need the wild animals and they need warmth so the ticks the suitability for ticks will cluster to the south Suitability for wildlife, uh, are mammals being warm-blooded animals? Uh, certainly anyone in New Brunswick will know that mice are really happy anywhere in the province, although they do seem to have a distinct predilection for people's basements. Uh, no, I'm being flippant there. Uh, so mice are prevalent throughout the province and because we're looking at as a disease that appears to be present in a lot of different wild species already. Yeah, I think leptospirosis is already established throughout the province and the effect of climate may well be primarily through increased flooding events that brings it, the, the leptospires in contact, into places where humans will contact them and pets. Thank you very much for that. Just a reminder to our participants, if you do have any questions, just to type them into the Q&A box below. 
Um, I'm not seeing any open questions right here, um, but I do have another question for you. Um, is that how can these research learnings be applied to other regions in the Maritimes or across Canada? Um, yeah, so that's, I think, really important. Um, mm -hmm. The What's happening in New Brunswick is obviously very important to the people who live here. Uh, and of course, the wildlife and the trees. But for the rest of Canada, I think what it's showing us is that wherever is that leptospirosis can be very widespread, even in the absence of signals coming from uh, increased human diagnoses. And our first, the first person who asked that question, really getting to the heart of the problem. There are a number of triggers that can be used in surveillance to say, hey, there may be a problem here. But looking at human reports of human cases may not be a very sensitive trigger because to get people who are exposed to go to the doctor to get the doctors to start thinking, should I do test for leptospirosis? If there's no awareness that it's already a problem, that's not going to be the first thing that your average family doctor is going to be looking at testing if you've got someone coming in with some very fairly general symptoms. Um, so yes, it, I think this kind of surveillance, probably wild rodents and yeah, wild caught rodent surveillance or canine zero surveys would be well worth doing throughout Canada. We have seen already, if you look at the cano, canine uh, sero surveys, we've seen a threefold increase in Quebec in the past few years and a 30-fold in Ontario in the cases of canine sero reactivity to leptospirosis. So we are seeing this increasing in frequency. Well, it's really interesting and I think something we need to to keep um, an eye on moving forward so uh, I don't see any more questions here so um, I think we'll wrap up here if um, any of our participants have any questions for Dr. Lloyd or Samantha um, they can feel free to email me at gpritchard at cpha.ca and I'd be happy to forward them on to our presenters today um, I will just change this here. all right well Thank you all again for joining us and thank you to Dr. Lloyd and Samantha for this wonderful presentation. Um, just as a quick reminder to all our participants to please don't forget to fill out our survey upon closing the webinar window. Um, you'll be redirected to our survey and um, we really look forward to your feedback. This is the first webinar um, in this series. So we're really interested to hear from you what you thought um, and you know, interest in topics for future webinars and then we can make you know, improvements and um, create those webinars based on your interest. Um, so thank you all. Thank you to our presenters and to our participants today. Um, we hope you have a wonderful rest of the day and um, please stay safe and take care. Thank you Bye. very much. Thank you. Bye.